feel so tight Your body's shaking from a rattlesnake bite Tearing down some hard man's road Waiting for your head to explode The night comes crashing and the thunder rolls Your eyes are burning like two hot coals Slow down brother, better heed the sound friend is a diamond Mrs. Mrs. Carson, this is Detective Inspector Stark. She'll be conducting your interview today. Thank you for coming in, Mrs. Carson. We appreciate it. Well, I don't really see that it's necessary. I understand, but this is a murder investigation. We need to be very thorough. I'm not under suspicion, am I? No, of course not. We just need some help with our inquiries. Should I have my lawyer present? I've already told your officer everything I know. If you feel that's necessary, but this is really just a formality and you're free to leave at any time. Well, I'm not here to be bullied or harassed. Thanks, Om. Filmed? Yes, Mrs. Carson. For everybody's protection, all interviews are filmed. Can we begin? The time is 2 p.m. Present in the room is Detective Inspector Sturrock interviewing Mrs. Anne Carson. Now, Mrs. Carson. We have reason to believe that you were contacted by Mandy O'Brien on the day that she was murdered. Yes. Yes, she called and said she had to see me. Hello? Who is it? Did you have any idea why she would want to see you? I'm sorry? No, none at all. I didn't know her. But then she said that she and Philip were in love and that he was going to leave me for her. She said it was vital that we met so that we could sort it out in a civilised way. And so you met her? No, I didn't meet her. Really? Really. Well, apparently your husband has a reputation around the hospital as someone who enjoys the company of pretty nurses. <laughs> Philip may enjoy flirting, but I'm not aware he's ever been unfaithful. Never. What about Jackie Ellenson? Who? We were told that she had a relationship with your husband that lasted for about six months. Well, I don't know anything about it. And Stephanie Anderson, do you know that name? Apparently she was also involved with your husband. This is ridiculous. Philip is a middle-aged man with a very busy work schedule. <laughs> Where on earth do you think he gets the time? Or the energy, I might add, for all these affairs? <laughs> Look, what you need to understand, Detective, is that Philip has been an extremely successful man. And successful people always have enemies who would be quite happy to tarnish their reputation. I see. How long have you been married, Mrs Carson? 25 years in August. That's quite an innings. You must have been very young when you met. Yes, we met at university. Philip was studying medicine and I was doing an arts degree. I had wanted to go into journalism, but that wasn't to be. Why was that? Well, Philip's study took up so much time that he couldn't work, so... I left uni to work to support both of us. And were you ever resentful that you had to give up your career for his? Not in the slightest. I decided long ago that fiction was far more interesting than facts, Detective. And as one of the leading cardiac surgeons in the country, Philip earns far more than I could have ever hoped to. Well, oh, very happy with the bargain we struck. But that bargain was under threat, wasn't it? What do you mean? Did you speak to your husband about it? Well, the girl called on Thursday morning, and Thursdays is Philip's day in theatre. And then he was having dinner with the hospital CEO, so I wasn't expecting no, him home until after midnight. 
Now is not a good time for me. And then he was gone before I got up the next morning. So we didn't catch up until the Friday night. And by then it just didn't seem important anymore, so I didn't bring it up. Well, a young woman calls you on Thursday morning, tells you she's having an affair with your husband and that he's going to leave you for her. And by the next night, it's no longer important? Yes. Well, the more I thought about it, the more absurd it seemed. So when did you talk to your husband about it? Well, Philip was at golf when your officer called yesterday morning to say, you know, that she had been murdered. Yes, can I help you? Good morning, Mrs Carson. I'm Detective Barnes. So we spoke about it when he got home. And how did your husband describe his relationship with the deceased? Said that she was a young nurse, new to the hospital, and that she'd developed a bit of a crush on him. And how did he say he was handling it? Said he was ignoring it. He hoped that once she settled in, it would stop. But apparently she was quite persistent. She wouldn't take no for an answer. I have nothing to hide. I've got nothing to fear. I've done nothing wrong, and you have nothing to worry about. So he denied having an affair with her? I didn't ask him if he was having an affair with her. <laughs> At approximately what time did the deceased call you, Mrs Carson? Oh, well, I, I don't know the exact time. About 10.30. I was just on my way out to a hair appointment at 10.45. Did you keep that appointment? Yes, of course. You know, cancel on Charles. We will wait six months to get another appointment. And then what did you do? I stopped at a cafe for lunch. I did some shopping and then I went home. I suppose I got back at about 5.30. Did you go out again at any time? No, I don't think so. I certainly didn't call anybody. No, yes I did. I called my mother at about like nine this? and then we spoke for maybe half an hour. No, I'm fine. Just had a big day, that's all. So... What time did you leave the cafe? Uh, 1.30, maybe 1.45. I really didn't take much notice. OK, so between 1.45 and about midnight, you were alone? Mm-hmm. No one noticed you come home at 5.30? A neighbour? Somebody walking the dog, perhaps? It's unlikely. The dog walkers have all finished their rounds by mid-afternoon. And the neighbours are hardly chummy. It's not unusual for someone to move in and then move out five years later and no one even registers they've arrived, let alone that they've gone. What kind of car do you drive, Mrs Carson? A silver Volvo. Hmm. How long would you say your conversation was with the deceased? Oh. A couple of minutes, maybe five. I had better things to do than listen to a love-struck schoolgirl, so I hung up. No. Well, that's very odd because the deceased's phone records suggest that she called you at 10 and the call wasn't disconnected until 10.25. Well, if you say it was 25 minutes, then perhaps it was. I must have forgotten how time flies when you're having fun. So what did you talk about for 25 minutes? Well, she started on about Philip and their grand passion. I see. I think the word soulmate was used. <laughs> Look, I think what you need to understand is that I know these things about Philip. It was all very Mills and Boone. I wasn't really listening. You weren't really listening. Oh, it was all such nonsense. As if Philip would ever leave me. I mean, I may like fiction detective, but not adolescent love stories. Why are you so sure that your husband would never leave you? When you've been married to someone for nearly 25 years, you do get some insight into their character. <laughs> oh, God. It's just my little way of saying... Oh. Thank you for oh, all of the dinners you host, good. for my papers and submissions that you made so carefully. If Philip had wanted to leave me for any of these, these women, 
that you say he was involved with. Don't you think he would have done it by now? I mean, what was he waiting for? There weren't any children to consider. He certainly wasn't hanging around for my money. <laughs> no. Philip would never leave me. Because he loves me. And he's always been faithful to me. Really. Really. I see. So where did the deceased want to meet you? At the Green Bay Bar in South Yarra. Hmm. At what time? Um, nine. Hmm. Well, that really is very strange because when the deceased called you at 10, she was meant to finish working Carlton at 6. So it's conceivable that she could meet you in a bar in South Yarra at 9. But then there was a late change to her roster and instead of finishing at 6, she was meant to start at 8. So it is a bit odd that she didn't try to call you to change the arrangement, isn't it? I mean, you were home after 5.30, weren't you? Mm -hmm. She could hardly meet you in a bar across town an hour into her shift, could she? Maybe she changed her mind. Maybe she was going to stand me up. Well, there is an alternative possibility. Let's try this scenario. Let's say, originally, the deceased wanted to meet you in Carlton at perhaps seven, an hour after her shift finished. That way, she didn't need to alter her arrangement because she could still get to work by eight. Isn't that what really happened, Mrs Carson? All right, yes. She did want to meet me at seven. But I didn't have an alibi for seven, so I just moved the times around a bit. Anyway, it's all academic because I didn't meet her. Well, unfortunately, I'd hardly call her academic, Mrs Carson. The point is, you had a motive. Oh, and motive? Oh, God, just because some child rings and says she's having an affair with my husband? You had a motive and you did have the opportunity. Only because I don't have a witness. But you can search every bar in Melbourne and no one will remember seeing me because I wasn't there. I was at home. Yes, you said. But we don't think the deceased wanted to meet you in a bar. Her body was found in Royal Park. Are you sure she didn't want to meet you there? <laughs> no. <laughs> she wanted to meet me in a bar. I wanted to meet her in Royal Park because I wanted her to sit around in the cold and, and wait. I wanted to see how long she would wait. <clears throat> it was a petty punishment but an appropriate one. Mrs Carson, this whole process will move much more smoothly if you could just tell us the truth. Now, we are just trying to reconstruct Mandy O'Brien's movements and yours on the day that she was murdered. But we can't do that unless you cooperate. I know. I just, just trying to protect myself. Yes, I understand that, but honestly, the best way to protect yourself is to tell me the truth. Yeah, of course. Now, I have the autopsy report here. Oh, great, it seems that the deceased was murdered sometime between 6pm and 9pm. Cause of death was multiple stab wounds to the heart and surrounding area. It appears that the killer was right-handed. Are you right-handed, Mrs Carson? Yes, are you? It also appears that the deceased was pregnant. Were you aware of that, Mrs Carson? No, why would I be? You don't have children, Mrs Carson? No. In the beginning, Philip was studying and we didn't have enough money. And then by the time we had enough money, I couldn't.
couldn't get pregnant. <sighs> Strange, isn't it? You can spend so much of your life worrying about pregnancy, taking pills and agonising when you're a few days late. Then you find out it was all for nothing. I was barren anyway. Such a, such a waste of time and thought and energy. Anyway, <laughs> Philip was never home. I would have had to have done it all on my own. He was never interested in children and he would never have sacrificed his career for them. Children demand a sacrifice. <laughs> he used to say, that they were like little Aztec gods, no matter how much blood you gave them. They always wanted more. So you don't think the deceased pregnancy would have made him more likely to leave you? No, I do not. Besides, how do I even know that that child was my husband's? That little slut could have been fucking the entire male staff at the hospital. And the patients as well, for all I know. But if it was your husband's, aren't you even a little bit concerned that it might have tipped the balance in no. her favour? Maybe he'd changed his mind about children. Maybe it had become very important to him, even seductive. Oh, you really don't know my husband. <laughs> the only thing he finds truly seductive is the adulation he receives from his work. Please welcome Dr Philip Carson. Seeing his name in an article of a prestigious international journal or being the guest of honour at some professional dinner. As Bernie said, most of the conferences I attend are about uh, heart surgery. But what I'd like to do tonight... Fame is and to glory to talk to you. are the greatest aphrodisiacs my husband has ever known. But how did it make you feel, knowing she was pregnant? But I didn't know, until you told me. Well, let's just explore that again, shall we? According to Mandy's flatmate, who was at home at the time she rang you, quote, I heard Mandy say, Philip and I want to be a family when the baby is born. That's why it's important that we work this out for the baby's sake. So you did know, Mrs Carson. Didn't it make you want to meet her? Weren't you the least bit? Of course not. Why should I care? As I keep saying, detective, but you keep not hearing, Philip would not have left me, baby or no baby. So it didn't matter what she looked like or how desperately she loved him. My world was not going to change. According to information from one of the residents in Gatehouse Street, Parkville, he was about to pull into his usual parking spot at 6.30pm on that Thursday night when a silver Volvo stole it from him. This is my parking spot. I live there. You can't possibly own the car park outside your house. It's permit only, if you don't mind. He was pretty angry about it because it Where wasn't a local it? car. That's why he remembered it. So we have a witness who puts your car at the crime scene at 6.30 when you deny being there. Now, as I keep saying, but you keep not hearing. We're just making inquiries. But instead of cooperating, you seem to be doing your very best to obstruct our investigations. All right. I did meet her, but I didn't kill her. She was alive when I left. Just thought that you wouldn't believe me and then I'd be on trial for something that I didn't do. We are only concerned with the facts here, not fiction. Now, could you please tell me what happened on Thursday night when you met Mandy O'Brien? As I said, I suggested Royal Park because I thought it would be pretty empty at that hour. 
I didn't even know if I was going to meet her. I know I said I would, but anyway, after the cafe, I just, I just drove around and around. I ended up in Williamstown. I, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. You didn't think of talking to a friend? Oh, God, no, I don't have any friends anymore. Anyway, how do you ring someone up and say, some child is pregnant with my husband's baby and she wants to meet me? But you did decide to meet her. Yes. I suppose my curiosity got the better of me. I was constantly wondering what she looked like. I always wondered what his sluts looked like. So you were aware of your husband's affairs? Oh, do I look stupid, detective? No, of course not. It's just that earlier you said... Oh, I know what I said. I told myself that story so often that half the time I believe it. Anyway, even if I hadn't been able to work it out, in my experience, there's always someone who's quite happy to share the good news with you. And you never spoke to your husband about these affairs? At first, I almost tried. I saw the look on his face, and I knew if I asked, he would tell me. Because he would never lie to me. But if I didn't ask, he wouldn't tell. Admitting the truth is not the same as lying, detective. It just allows you to believe whatever you want to believe. I knew if I confronted Philip, my marriage would be over. And I didn't want that. I like being Philip's wife. My marriage may not have turned out the way I expected, but then marriages rarely do. But all in all, you know, short-term affair was a small price to pay. How could you be so sure that these affairs would be short-term? Well, you see, in the beginning, I couldn't. It was all very clenched teeth and lots of anxiety. Getting back to Thursday night. You parked the car in Gatehouse Street at 6.30 and, what, walked into the park? Yeah. No, I mean, yes, I, I, I parked the car at 6.30, but I didn't walk in immediately. I sat in the car for another oh, 20 minutes, deciding whether I would meet her or not. I didn't want to be the first there. walked in, she was already there. And then what happened? Well, as pathetic and ridiculous as it may seem, I think I went into shock. Hi, I'm, I'm Mandy. Thanks for I've been I expecting this model type and he was this plain, mousy child. I mean, Philip had fallen for this? I couldn't see Philip with her. I didn't want to see him with her. And then I st started to think about all the others. <laughs> to wonder if they were all like this. Did you speak to her at all? I don't know. I'm sorry. I really don't. She, she was just talking and talking and I knew the words were in English, but I, I just couldn't put them together. Gonna be with me now. And she just kept going on and on and on, like I wasn't there. In love. And then 
suddenly I realised she wasn't there to, to gloat. The most inspirational she just wanted to talk about him. I mean, here she was pregnant with my husband's child and she was going on like she was the president of his fan club or something. Do you have any idea how long you were there for? No, no, just... Suddenly I just knew, I just, I just had to get away. Away from that whinging, whiny little voice, away from that plain, shiny face, from that pathetic creature telling me how much my husband loved her. So you have no idea what time it was when you walked away? I don't know, I, I didn't even look at the clock when I got back in the car, I just, I just drove in a kind of blur and I don't even know how I got home. And then I just sat on the couch, I don't know for how long, and that's when I called my mother. And then I looked at my watch and it was nine o'clock. Did you see anyone, no. anyone else, when no. you left the park? No, I didn't, I didn't see anything. Look, I, I know how this looks, but, but honestly, I didn't kill her. I swear, she was alive when I left her. Yes. Well, Mrs Carson, thank you for your cooperation. That'll be all. Interview ended at 2.30 p.m. What, I, I can leave? Yes, of course. You've helped us enormously with our inquiries and we're very grateful. So that's it? Yes. We have a witness who heard the deceased arguing with somebody at 7.45. And we've also obtained traffic photographs of your car running a red light in Ligon Street at 7.40, so... <sighs> Look forward to the fine. It lets you off the hook. For your information, it does appear that the deceased was stalking your husband. He didn't lie about that. However, we can be certain that your husband was not the father of her baby. We tracked down his urologist in New York and confirmed that, as he told us, he had a vasectomy 20 years ago. A vasectomy? 20 years ago. Apparently it was performed while he attended a conference there. Seems like just another instance when he um, omitted the truth. You don't have to go ahead and mount a big search It's as clear as a road To that old Spanish church As plain as a nose On your cute little face It's an open and shut case It will come quick Or ease and slow When trouble hits just won't let go So clear the air And get it off your chest Take your medicine And hope for the best Pull it up to the mirror Tell me what you see Slip from bad to worse. It would take a miracle to lift that curse. There's always something you can't resist. A slow thing with a bitter twist.
How are you, Gina? Yeah, fine, I guess. Okay. How did you feel about coming here today? I didn't want to come. Why? Well, because we're not getting anywhere, are we? It's just the same old stuff over and over again. You know, I thought I would have achieved something by now. After all, it's been nearly six months. How long is it going to take? It's difficult to say. How long is a piece of string? Oh, <laughs> you can do better than that. You must have some idea. No, I don't. Really? Really? Well, I, I don't think I can stick it out for years if I'm not getting somewhere. So you don't think you're making any progress? No. No, not at all. We just keep talking about my family and my childhood. That's all in the past. I just want to move on. But the past does have an impact on our present. Yeah, well, maybe. I mean, if you say so. I don't know. All I know is that, well, this is starting to feel like a waste of time and money. What are your dreams saying? <laughs> well, I don't have a lot that I can remember. They usually just disappear when the alarm sounds. <sighs> I did have one the other night. Yeah, I was in the place where I used to live when I was at uni. There were... There were four monks sitting in a line, hunched over, rocking and chanting in front of a fireplace. And I knew I had to say something to break the spell, but I couldn't. My voice was just stuck in my throat. So I picked up a candle and I threw it into the fireplace because I thought that would break the spell, but they just looked at me with this really sinister smile. What kind of monks were they? Oh, Catholic monks. With hoods over their heads. But you're not a Catholic? No. <laughs> and you couldn't speak? Not a word. Hmm. That's not the first time you've had a dream where you can't speak, is it? No. No, I have them a lot. <sighs> yep. And falling dreams. You've never mentioned to me that you went to university. Didn't I? No. You said that you worked as a waitress and in a pub for three years before you joined the police force. Yeah, well, that's true, I did. So when did you go to university? After I left secondary school. I worked as a waitress and in a pub while I was studying. Thank you very much. Not bad, thanks. Still dancing? What were you studying? English literature, mainly. Oh, yes, I was going to do my honours thesis on Shakespeare, but it was not to be. Uh-huh. Why? I dropped out. Didn't even finish my degree. I decided I preferred facts to fiction, so I took a cadetship with Victoria Police. Hmm. That's a very abrupt career change. Yeah, I suppose so. When did you have this dream? Um, hmm. Would have been Sunday night, I think. Were you doing anything on Sunday that might have triggered the dream? Not really. What were you doing on Sunday? Um, well, I've been working a case. The nurse found stabbed in Royal Park. You said you had a copy of these emails? Yes, I do. Fantastic. She'd been stalking a doctor at the hospital and I was interviewing his wife. But I knew his wife didn't kill her. Yeah. Oh, well, among other things, women don't use knives. Really? Mm -hmm. Aren't there exceptions to that? Well, sure, there's exceptions to every rule, but she wasn't in. So who did it? The deceased's ex. It's usually close to home with murders. And where does your mother live? Uh, Northcote. And can she verify that? Yes, she He's can. got a pretty strong alibi at the moment, but we can probably break it if we do a bit more digging. Now, if you keep at it long enough, eventually the truth comes out. The truth. Do you think telling the truth could break a spell? Oh, what, in the dream, you mean? Yeah. Mm. Oh. I don't know. It wasn't as if I had anything particular to say in the dream. I just had to say something, anything, to break the spell. <laughs> and I couldn't. It's very interesting that it took place in the house, the dream I mean, <clears throat> in the house where you lived when you went to university. Did anything happen during your questioning that might have reminded you about something or someone from uni? When... She talked about her husband, the wife, I mean. She said that 
Adulation was his greatest aphrodisiac. There was a lecturer at uni, she was a bit like that. She wanted everybody to love her. But was use all gently, her. for in the very torrent, tempest, and as I may say, whirlwind of your passion. Was she your lecturer? Yeah. Yeah, she moved from Monash in my second year, taught a unit on Shakespeare. How did you feel about it? Oh, I thought she was wonderful. Yeah, everybody thought she was wonderful. Why? <laughs> she was just bright, clever. More alluring than beautiful, but... Oh, she wore beautiful jewellery. You know, long, dangling silver earrings, bracelets. Had this long, dark mop of hair she would toss casually. She was just stylish, you know, when all the other lecturers were bookish and considered and dreary. She was vibrant, passionate, alive. <laughs> Called herself an educator, not a lecturer. How could you not follow that? I know exactly. What did you think? I loved it. Did you? Yeah. yeah and I think Tell me about your relationship with her. Oh, well, you know, I've done the Shakespeare unit. You know? um, handed in my work, got a pretty good mark. I nearly killed myself on that essay trying to impress her. <laughs> and not long after that, she, she kind of caught up with me in a bookshop and not surprised to find you here. said how much she liked the essay. <laughs> that was a great paper you wrote. Oh, thanks. I'm glad you liked it. Took me ages. Mmm, I had some really original insights. In fact, I'm thinking of writing a paper. Would you be interested in working with me on it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Would you have any time to talk now? <laughs> Fantastic. OK, look, let me buy you a drink and uh, we'll start kicking around a few ideas. Oh, I couldn't believe my luck. It was... It was as if Athena had stepped off Mount Olympus to speak to me. So we've been here now. And we had a drink or two and... Then she said she wanted to continue the discussion and she invited me to meet her in her office the following day. And you went? Yes, sure, I went. Then one thing led to another. Yeah, I found excuses to drop in and see her. She gave me articles to read. You're by myself, there is no hour so fit. We well, became friends. Just friends? <laughs> yes, just friends. God. Yeah, well, look, I admit I was pretty smitten with her, but it wasn't sexual. She had a husband and kids. I didn't fantasise about sleeping with her. No, my deep, dark secret isn't that I'm gay. <laughs> How did your friends feel about your friendship with this woman? What was her name? Adele. Adele. I don't know. I never asked. And gradually I just saw more and more of her. Before long, I was like a fixture in the English faculty. What do you mean by that? Well, I just did admin stuff for her. You know, filing and the like. I read papers, highlighted the important bits, organised her mark sheets, minutes and meetings, picked up her dry cleaning, all the stuff she was too busy to do. Seemed to spend most of my spare time there. I got to know Joanne, the admin secretary. No, I think it's the purpose, so we're going to delete that. And then it goes on and then it finishes, yes. Soon, I had my own key to the office. How did the other members of staff view her? Oh, as I said, everybody liked her. You know, she always found something complimentary to say about you that made you feel special. This is nice. It's very unusual, isn't it? It's, it's quite worldly. It was a game for her, but I didn't realise it at the time. Yeah, she said something nice to you so that you would like her. She didn't have to mean it when she said it. All that mattered was that you believed her and you liked her for it. Oh, hi, Antonio. Who looks after you? So did you think she was manipulative? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she wrote the book on manipulation. <laughs> I mean, nobody, nobody really knew how she felt about them. Did that concern you? No, not really. 
No, look, I just thought it was part of our special bond. I knew she lied to others, but she never lied to me. So did you write the paper together? Yeah, sort of. I wrote 98% of it and she made some minor changes and then we got it published. Ta-da! Uh-huh. Well done. Mm. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Here's our bit. And then she said we should write another one and we should meet in her office on weekends. And did you? Yeah, well, I went most weekends. But sometimes she didn't turn up. It was basically a cover. Hello? Oh, hello, it's, it's James here. Is Adele there? No, no, she's not here at the moment. Um, well, could you get her to... She was having an affair with one of the law worries. guys, okay, so... Bye. You know, if I was in her office and her husband and kids rang, I could tell them she was off getting a coffee and she'd call them back. Hello? Yeah, yeah, no, he just called. So you better give him a ring. How did that make you feel? Yeah, well, Hi. I guess I should say that I was outraged at being used, but I wasn't. I was pretty happy with the bargain we'd struck. I mean, my loyalties were squarely with her, not with her husband. I was her confidant. And that made me feel so special. And having her as my co-author, that was furthering my career, so win-win all around. But something happened. You didn't finish your degree. That's right. What? She died. How? Uh, she was... found in her office one Sunday afternoon. And she had been... stabbed with a sharp object and um, her letter opener was missing. And the office was trashed. The police said that um, they thought that somebody had gone in there looking for money and Adele had disturbed them. And there'd been a lot of break-ins on campus and this was seen as one that got out of hand. So was the murderer found? No. No, the case was never solved. How did you find out? Late that Sunday night, the police turned up. Trina Stark? Because there'd, there'd so been no I sign of a forced entry. Can I have a word? They were checking the alibis of everyone who um, had a key to the faculty office. Did you have an alibi? Yeah. Yeah. Ironclad. I'd been out celebrating with friends the night before. I'd stayed up late, drank too much. Most of them were still asleep on my floor the next morning. We were celebrating because she'd written me a... Um, glowing recommendation for a research position the following year. It was highly unorthodox, but she'd given me a copy of the letter and... Her, um... <laughs> With her recommendation... <laughs> the job was mine, my future. Rosie. Did you kill her?
You dreamt it on Sunday. She died on a Sunday. There was something you wanted to say, but couldn't. So I thought it had to be a secret. You said earlier that being a lesbian wasn't your deep, dark secret. They suggested that you had one. Those four monks, the four aspects of you, mind, body, spirit and emotion, all working together to stop that secret being told. Look, you've been coming here for six months now. I've had time to piece things together. You have commitment issues. You can't trust people. You have seemed disconnected from your emotions. Some trauma had taken place. I needed you to tell me what it was. But how did you know that I killed her? You couldn't have worked that all out from one dream. No, it wasn't just the dream. There's been a lot of signposts there. I had to wait for it all to come together. Sometimes you play a hunch. As you said, the truth comes out if you wait long enough. Mm. So what do we do now? You're going to report me to the police? You know that anything you say here is privileged. <sighs> do you think about this much? No, believe it or not, I haven't even thought about it for ages now. You know, it was, it was like the wife I interviewed. She said that she had told herself a story for so long that she'd come to believe it was true. It was like that. God, everybody was so sorry for me when Adele died. Everybody expected me to be devastated, and I was. I just, I dropped out immediately and, and said I needed to get away. Mum and Dad hired me a house down in Anglesey and just cut myself off from the world. By well, the time I got back, it was all over. Nobody wanted to talk about it. I told everybody that I was joining the police force and they all thought that I was on some campaign for justice or something. They probably thought that I was going to reopen the case one day and bring Adele's murderer to the dock. Well, either that or, or they, they thought I'd last six months and then give it away, but I stuck with it. And before long, it was as if that part of my life ever happened. Why did you do it? I don't know, I don't know. It was just accidental, really. It was just you know, heat of the moment stuff. There were two things that happened in quick succession. I was at a pub one night. Yeah, I've done Hamlet. Just before that Sunday. So have you come across Adele Parkinson? Yeah, why? Has uh, she found herself a slave yet? What? At Monash, she'd hook up with some bright, nerdy girl without many friends. She asked him to write a paper with her. They'd do all of the writing and she'd take all of the credit. The next minute they'd be picking up her dry cleaning, doing a filing, getting a coffee, all the things she was too lazy to do. Eventually, oh, look, I, I left the pub pretty quickly after that. I just, just kept going over my whole relationship with Adele, trying to work out if I was the tragic or if it really was different with me. And the thing I clung on to was the fact that she was recommending me for this research position, which she told me she had. She'd even read bits of the recommendation out to me. I had keys, so I let myself into Adele's office to check and I found the letter. It said the committee were accepting Adele's recommendation and appointing Andrew Sullivan. Andrew Sullivan. Adele had always said that he was brain dead and she had to spend a lot of time with him. You know, he'd never had an original idea in his life and now she was recommending him? I just, 
I, look, I think I just went into shock. I, I couldn't believe it. it. It was just inconceivable. I mean, there had to be some kind of mistake. I had to correct that recommendation. The next night, I just, I got a few friends together to celebrate my good fortune and show them the letter recommending me. And we hit the pucks. Cheers. Congratulations. Oh, everybody was so happy for me. I was finally getting something back from Adele. Anyway, we, we went back to my place and, um, Oh, God, we just drank some more and eventually they all crashed out in the lounge room. <laughs> I went to bed about four or five. But I couldn't sleep. Just kept thinking how stupid I'd been. God, I'd betrayed. <laughs> Knew she would be in the office that morning, so. So I decided to confront her. Andrew Sullivan? You recommended Andrew Sullivan? Oh, Gina. I know how upset you must be. You were never meant to find out. But I couldn't recommend you, given our relationship. I was in an extremely difficult position, you must understand that. As a lecturer, I have a reputation to uphold for fairness and equity. Wouldn't do either of us any good if my decision was seen as partisan. It must be seen as above reproach. Andrew Sullivan. OK, look. This isn't common knowledge, but... Andrew and I are in love. Well, we've been having an affair for some time now, and... I had to give him the post, otherwise he'd have to leave uni, and he needs the income so that we can set up house together. Oh, it was all so much crap! It was just another lie to go along with the millions of others. Oh, look, yes, yeah, sure, she'd probably slept with him, but she was never going to leave her husband for him. She had flings, and when she got bored with them, she would tell them the sob story about how her husband and kids had to come first. She had it down to a fine art. That's why she would never leave him. He was her perfect out. Look, it was a really big surprise to me as well. I didn't see it coming, but he's a really fascinating person. I oh, I felt nauseated. <gasps> totally sick to my stomach, like I could vomit for a hundred years and still have bile left in my gut. And she just kept on talking and talking, almost as if I wasn't there. I suppose, in a way, I wasn't. I was just a pathetic tragic like the rest of them. You know, they say that if you corner a rat, it'll go for your throat. It's true. She went for the jugular. Look, I didn't want to have to say this, and you're not going to want to hear it, but the real reason that I couldn't recommend you is that your work is substandard. It's intellectually sloppy. It lacks academic rigour. Now, I carried the workload on the paper that we had published because of our friendship, but I can't cover for you in a research post. I remember just staring at her because I could not believe she could lie like that, blatantly, and to me. 
It was then that I realised that I never wanted to hear her say another lie again. There could be no more lies. She couldn't be allowed to say another lie to hurt somebody else. So, like I was watching someone else do it, I just picked up the letter open and I stabbed her through the heart. <laughs> Surprisingly enough, she had one. Oh. At least it shut her up. It didn't take long at all, really. Surprised. Arrived. I just went into shock. And I was obviously so deeply distressed that they didn't even question me very closely. They never asked me if I killed her. I never told a lie. I just omitted the truth. So how do you feel now, now that you've talked about it? I know I should feel guilty, but I don't. That's what all the time in Anglesey was about. Not the fact that I killed her, but the fact that I don't care that I killed her. It was like a victimless crime. But what about her husband? Her children, her parents? Her parents were dead. She was an only child. Well, her husband probably knew she was cheating on him. He wasn't stupid. He was just believing what he needed to believe. I saw him a couple of years later. Gina. James. Oh, hello. Hello, James. Yeah. How are you going? I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm good. good. Yeah, I haven't seen you for... Two years, three years, I oh, know, ages. Yeah, yeah, probably, yeah, since... He'd married the housekeeper, yeah. said the kids were great, doing really well at school. Yeah, said they'd embrace their new mum with open arms. Why not? She spent a lot more time with them than Adele ever did. Yeah, a photo of us. Oh. Yeah. yeah. And after a while, I couldn't help but think that God was on my side. There is a divinity that shapes our ends. Rough, hew them how we will. Now, there were heaps of instances when it all could have gone pear-shaped. I could have got a really young, enthusiastic cop who wanted a scalp on his belt, but instead, no, I get a guy who's looking at retirement who couldn't be bothered digging too deeply. He was happy with the robbery gone wrong theory. So there were a million times that I could have been found out, but it didn't happen. You said earlier that it was heat of the moment stuff, yet you forged a letter and went out with your friends on the strength of it to celebrate. Now, what was that if you weren't organising an alibi? I wanted her dead. That's all I could think about from the minute I opened that letter, but I wasn't sure when the crunch came that I'd had the guts to do it. But you did. Yes. I did. Do you see any contradiction in being someone who catches murderers to getting away with one yourself? Should I? Oh, Glenda, lots of people who are murdered aren't saints. Sometimes the murderer is really doing society a favour. But you catch them anyway, even if they're doing a good deed. Not always. No, sometimes it is very difficult to get enough evidence to bring someone to justice. 
I mean, the courts can disallow evidence on some slight pretext or point of law, and often it's impossible to get a conviction. Are you saying that if you decide someone deserved to be murdered, then you don't really try to build a case against the person who killed them? Maybe. Well, isn't that a little unethical? Oh, look, if I was meant to have been punished, I would have been. The fact that I wasn't shows that there is some higher power up there who approves of what I'm doing. Now, Oprah Winfrey says that failure is God's way of saying, excuse me, but you must be moving in the wrong direction. Well, I must be moving in the right one because I just keep getting promoted. Am I going to be here for years? Well, might be a long piece of string. He's down at Anglesey with some friends. He's doing some cramming before exams. Oh, so it's just us then? Yeah. Oh, good. A girl's night out. Mm. <laughs> it's always nice to see Michael, but sometimes it's really good to have you all to myself. Mm. Good. We better hurry. Yeah, I'm not sure if I want to go. Is that okay? You're kidding. You love Iranian cinema. Yeah, just not tonight. Oh. Oh, okay. What are we staying? Yeah. Do you want another takeaway? Yeah. Okay. Let's see what we have. We have, um, oh, look, uh, Thai, uh, Italian, Japanese, Chinese, Indian. I think there's even a Mongolian one. I thought there was... What do you fancy? You know what? I'm not very hungry. You choose. You don't want to see a film and you don't want to choose a takeaway? Now I'm really concerned. Okay, what's the matter? It's one of my patients. I just keep thinking about her. Normally I can be more detached, but she's, she's got under my guard. I've seen all kinds. I've seen sex addicts and drug addicts and problem gamblers, alcoholics and uh, bipolars and psychotics, and, and now I've got a murderer. A murderer? Are you serious? Ah. Are you gonna tell the police? No, of course not, it's privileged. And it happened a long time ago. Who is it? Is it another one of your rich and famous clients? Come on, you can tell me. I want all the gossip. Well, you're not going to get it, and you know better than to ask. Anyway, I'm not sure she actually did it. Can I get a nut? Yeah. What makes you think that? Well, it's a bit neat. I don't know if it's a revenge fantasy or if she's really done it. Mmm. These cases are right up your alley. You love them. Well, I don't know if love's the right word, but... Yes, you're right. I enjoy a challenge. Well, normally I do. I'm at a bit of a low ebb at the moment. Oh, and what's wrong? You've got better things to do than listen to me, Winch. I'll go. Hey, listen, 
I love a good whinge. Well, if you must know, it's my call. What do you mean, it's my call? I don't know, I don't know. Everything's different lately. He, um, maybe everyone was right. Maybe he is too young for me. Maybe I've just been fooling myself. Where's all this come from? You know that Michael adores you. I mean, I've never seen a man as desperately in love as Michael is with you. You know, I was just saying to Donna the other day that she was so wrong about him. You make such a terrific couple. Mm. It doesn't feel that way now. Well, of course not. You're busy. He's studying for exams. He's not here to leave romantic notes on the mirror. <laughs> It's not like that. It's not the romance I miss. It's him. He used to be happy to be with me, and lately he just seems jumpy and tense when I'm around. Yeah, well, he's, he's incredibly stressed at the moment. You know, getting this law degree means a great deal to him. You know, I just think you're feeling a bit neglected. It's a bad habit of yours to think you don't deserve happiness, and, and you do. And he's absolutely gorgeous. And you're incredibly lucky. Well, and he's incredibly lucky. This will all pass once his exams are over. Mm, maybe you're right. I can't help thinking there's more to it than exam pressure and stress, though. Like what? I think he's having an affair. <laughs> oh, come on. No. Yeah, I know. You, I know you may think I'm being ridiculous, but something's not right. I've been racking my brains and this is all I can come up with. It's not just feeling neglected. I can cope with that. It's him. You know, something's changed and I think he's having an affair. Well, I think you're right. You're being ridiculous. No. Have you spoken to him about this? I thought about it, but then I thought if he denied it, I wasn't sure I'd believe him, so I didn't. Now listen to me, Glennie. You have some really serious trust issues. For no real reason and with no evidence, you decide that he's having an affair. And then you decide that if you talk to him about it, you wouldn't believe him because he denied it. I mean, this is just, it's just crazy thinking. Not everyone's going to break your heart, Glennie. There are some good people in the world and you finally found one. Mm. Maybe you're right. Michael loves you. And only you. Now, what did we decide about the takeaway? We didn't. <laughs> Come on. Help me out here. We can have Turkish, we can have Indian. <laughs> That no, look, I think I'll go. It's just, it's just that um, I've done something that I'm not really proud of, uh, particularly after what you just said. And what on earth has someone like you done that you're too embarrassed to admit to? Well, I'm, I'm too ashamed to tell you. Spit it out. Come on, what is it? You'll really think I've lost it. Well, it's not going to be the first time. <laughs> what have you done? I hired a private detective. <laughs> you what? I hired a private detective. <laughs> Are you insane? Yeah, I knew you'd say that. That's why I didn't want to tell you. <laughs> so when did you do this? Last week. Ah. This is unbelievable. So how did you find him? Her. It's a woman, actually. I looked online. You picked someone off the internet? Well, I didn't know anyone else who'd used one, so I couldn't ask for recommendations. Besides, that's the whole point. It's meant to be discreet. Oh, I thought I was unshockable. So you, you just rang this woman? And, and then what? I made an appointment. Just like that? Just like that. I have reason to believe my partner is um, having an affair. As I told you, he is... Some photographs of him. Mm -hmm. His name. So when do you get the verdict? I've got it.
Have you opened this? No. I've been driving around with it all day. Even ended up at Brighton at one point. Sometimes I'd be overwhelmed with the urge to open it and then I'd be so horrified at what I'd done, I just wanted to burn it. Mm. I don't think you should open it. You know, if Michael ever found out, he may not be able to forgive you. And if he's innocent, as I'm sure he is, you may not be able to forgive yourself. I... I really think you should burn this and just... just forget about it. Maybe you're right. I am right. <laughs> I don't know what to do anymore. You should listen to me. That's what friends are for. But I'll always wonder and I don't know if I can live with that. Look, if you and Michael are to have a future together, you've really got to get over this stuff. You can't just run to a private detective every time that you feel a bit threatened. You've got to conquer this, Glennie. Really? Really? Look, up. I'll, I'll get the lighter. No, no, wait a minute. I really need to know what's in that, but I'm too scared to open it. What if I'm right? Will you read it for me, please? You want me to read this? Yeah, Sue, I trust you. <laughs> OK, if it'll help, I'll read it. <laughs> Just as I thought, it's all clear. You sure that's what it said? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> God, I'm so relieved. Thank God. I was, I was being stupid. <laughs> okay, I, I want to read it now. <laughs> I thought you said you trusted me. Well, I should trust you, shouldn't I, Susan? Is there any reason why I shouldn't trust you? <sighs> You've read this. Do I look stupid? Of course I've read it. But it was only confirmation I've known for two weeks now. How? 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 How did I find out when you'd been so careful? Oh, just little things you couldn't possibly control. In this case, it was a mobile phone. Michael really liked mine, so I bought him an identical one. And one day last month, they were both on the charger and they got mixed up. Then my bill arrives. Apparently, I made three calls to you on the same day. And then I realised that they were made at times I had patience. And the penny dropped. It was when the phones were swapped. I tried all kinds of explanations. Maybe he was organising a surprise party for me, or <laughs> maybe he wanted to buy me some jewellery and needed some help. You've got no idea what kind of hoops I jumped through to make excuses for you both. But I, I couldn't think of anything plausible. And God knows, I tried. And then I started dropping your name into conversations. Just to see how he'd react. And he would change the subject as quickly as possible without being too obvious. Oh, she looked terrific. Really? Mm. Mm. And then he started making slightly disparaging remarks, some minor criticism, and that sealed it. I was still hoping I was wrong when I went to the private detective, but she gave me the proof. So why all the games tonight if you knew? I was hoping you'd own up. When I said I thought Michael was having an affair, I wanted you to tell me the truth. I was giving you a chance. If you'd been honest with me, maybe then I could have some respect for you. But you made it all about me. It was all my stuff. It was all my baggage. Jesus, you're fucking my lover behind my back, but I'm to blame for being suspicious? Fuck, you're a piece of work. I'm sorry, Glenny. Oh, I'm so sorry. I've behaved really badly. Worse than that, I've behaved disgracefully, or whatever other words you want to put onto it. <sighs> you've got to believe me, I never, I never meant to hurt you. And you've got to believe me, Michael, Michael loves you.
Why on earth would I believe that? Because it's true. Look, it was just, it was, it was sex, that's all it was. M Michael doesn't love me. I, I don't love him. <laughs> I just thought I did. You, you know, when you got back from Lawn and you, you, you gushed about him, you, you, you made him sound like he was just the perfect lover. I, <laughs> I guess I, I, I just wanted that too. So when did it start? <laughs> what, you, you want all the grubby details? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess you're entitled to them. Uh, it was after Donna's party. See you back. Oh, see you. Oh, good oh. Hey, Glenny, see you later. Bye, Suze. I'll call you. Okay. okay, bye. It happened very quickly. In the car. The, the next morning, I, I thought I just imagined it. And then he called. Hello? Who? He wanted to apologise. He wanted my assurance that I, that I wouldn't tell you. I, I was still so hungover, I, I asked him to call me back. And then he, when he did call back, I, I told him I thought he should come over, we should talk about it. He was reluctant, he didn't want to, but I, I pressured him. And he finally agreed to come over for a drink. But then he rang again. <laughs> Why not? He said he changed his mind. But finally I convinced him to come over. They must have been the three calls that you had on your bill. So we had a drink. And we agreed that we were both ashamed of what we'd done. So, yeah, I, mean, I don't know. It's just really, it was really funny to meet you the other day and just... That's it? Yeah. I don't don't know. you think I'm a little bit too old for you? Not at all. No? We agreed that, that you must never find out. We agreed that it must never happen again. But it did? Yeah. Yeah, it did. Because all the time while we were making these agreements, I kept wondering what it would be like if he hadn't have been drunk. And there he was, just sitting across from me and all I had to do was just, just to reach out. And you did? Yes, I did. Was it fun, laughing at me behind my back? Did it give you some kind of delicious pleasure in deceiving me? Did that spice things up for you? It wasn't like that. It wasn't like that at all. It was a, it was a disaster, Glenny. It was a total disaster. It was awkward and strained and, and, and tense. But obviously not bad enough for you to stop. Look, when he left, he said that this would never happen again. And a couple of weeks went by and, and there was no contact at all. But it was, it was me. I, I, I couldn't stop thinking about him. I, I guess I was obsessed. I used to wander past the cafe just to see if he'd, if he'd finished his shift. And then um, and last weekend, I, I went past the cafe and he, he had finished a shift and he, was, he looked really tired and I offered him a lift. He was reluctant, but I, I, I pressured him. I convinced him that it was just a lift. So we drove to the park, the one near your place, and I, I tried to tell him how I felt, but he just, he wouldn't listen. <laughs> Well, you've got to hold up your end of the bargain, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, I'm doing the best I can, OK? Yeah, well, so am I. Oh, he just kept on saying that th nice this, what had happened should never have happened. And he'd, he'd regretted it really deeply and, and that he'd, he loved you and he, he didn't want to endanger that at all. 
but I wouldn't take no for an answer. I said to him, if you don't sleep with me, I'll tell her. I just wanted one more time and then I promised it would never happen again. If you hadn't have hired a private detective for that particular week, <laughs> there'd be no evidence. If Michael loves me as much as you say he does, why did he ever let this happen? I don't know. Maybe sleeping with me was a way of proving that he was still independent and, and, and in control, but it backfired on him when he realised how much he loves you. Do you have any idea what you've done to me? When I opened that envelope, I can't even begin to describe how violently angry I was. I was totally consumed by it. I wanted to tip petrol on you both and set you on fire. I've never understood betrayal before. It's just been a concept, letters that made a word, but it is far more powerful than I had ever imagined and so painful. Fuck, sometimes I couldn't even breathe for the pain of it. How long have we been friends? It's over 25 years and I did not see this coming. I thought you cared about me. You knew how much I loved Michael. You knew how important he was to me. I'd given up thinking that anyone would ever love me. And then there he was, telling me he was in love, writing me notes, leaving flowers on my doorstep. At first, I didn't really trust it. It was only at the hospital I... I started to think, wow, maybe... Maybe this young man really loves me. He didn't have to be there. It was only a minor procedure, but he was there. He was there for me. He looked like he cared. He looked like he... Like he really loved me, but I suppose that was just a lie. Okay, you see any white lights? Look the other way. Okay. okay. Yep. Uh, see any sexy doctors? Yeah. Just don't notice them. I could, no, I can't promise yeah, that. Why can't I just... Come... No, now. That's going up. And the really pathetic thing is how quickly I fell for it. <sighs> Go home. I must look unspeakable. I want to stay. Watch over you. You sleep. And when I think of all the lies there must have been, oh, you know, I just felt so humiliated and just so stupid and so betrayed. And then just, just fat and ugly and old and, and I couldn't help but wonder how all our friends would smirk and snigger when they found out that yet another one of my lovers had left me, that Glennie's toy boy had been having it off with her friend. I think I went a bit mad. I kept hoping I'd be struck by lightning. I wanted to kill you both. I wanted to kill you both so much. But I didn't have the guts, and I didn't have the guts to kill myself. But something, something had to take away this terrible pain. So yesterday I went and saw Donna, and she was terrific. She dropped everything to see me. She didn't once say, I told you so. And I wept, and I alternated between self-pity and revenge. And then when finally I had nothing more to say, she gently suggested that I'd always had a bit of a blind spot about you, that I should have seen through you years ago. Oh, say what you like about me. I deserve it all. But Michael is the best thing that's ever happened to you, Glennie. If Michael ever loved me, he wouldn't have lied to me. I can handle anything if it's the truth, and he should have known that. And omitting the truth is just the same as lying. I know you're really angry, Glennie. Just talk to Michael. Try and work this out. No. I will never forgive you or him. That might be bad karma, but frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. He will lose his nice house. 
He will come home tonight and he will find his bags packed on the porch with the locks changed. He will lose his nice weekends away and his expensive dinners out. Right in the middle of exams. It's not quite the same as setting him on fire, but at the very least it will cause him some discomfort. I suppose that was him. No, it was so... No, 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 don't fucking bother to lie! I wouldn't believe you now, even if it was the truth. Take him in or throw him out, he's of no concern to me. And as for you, when I walk out that door, you will no longer be a part of my life. Your phone messages will go unanswered and I will burn all forms of mail you send unopened. Nothing more to say. She was here when you called, so I couldn't talk. She's found out. You idiot. You stupid moron. Apparently you swapped phones one day. Why on earth couldn't you have been more careful? Listen, we've come too far to throw this away. Get on to it. It's Susan. Can you give me a call when you get in? Thanks. It's important. Oh, Mama's little baby's gone bad. From her lips down to her shoes. She went and sold everything she had. Ticket to the blues. There was silence when you left me, girl. I remember not a tear that fell. Now we cry like little children on a broken down carousel. Can I talk to you for a second? Yeah. We'll um, take a short break. Oh, thank heavens for small mercies. Interview is suspended at 2.45. Change your attitude. Got anything out of her? She's a tough nut to crack. I mean, she admits to being there. She admits that they had a row. Of course she swears that he was alive when she left him, <laughs> you know. Mm. Have you turned up anything? No, no prize, but uh, a lot of parking tickets. Mm -hmm. See, so, yeah, her credit cards are all maxed out, but the thing is, she drives a pretty flash car she paid cash for about four months ago. Mm. I mean, she obviously likes cars and turns them over pretty regularly. Yeah, mm. well, hard to know where she gets that kind of money from on her salary. Any unusual deposits into her bank account? Nope, just a regular paycheck. Mm, well, our girl is up to something. I can smell it. Just need to figure out what it is. Be interesting to hear what her colleagues have to say about her and her bosses, see if they can explain where she gets this kind of money from. Let me know if something turns up. I think I'll take over now. 
See how she responds to a woman's touch. <laughs> oh, I like that suit. Gives you height. <laughs> Thanks, boss. Good afternoon, Miss Riley. I'm Detective Inspector Sturrock, and I'll be conducting your interview from now. I know you've been here for quite a while. Can we get you a cup of tea, coffee, anything to eat? No, thank you. I'd like to get out of here. Yes, I can understand that, but this is a murder investigation and we need to be very thorough. So while we're waiting for your lawyer to arrive, can we continue? The time is 3pm. Present in the room is Detective Inspector Sturrock and Detective Paul Petroni interviewing Ms Susan Riley. Now, I'd like to start with where you met the deceased. Uh, it was at a restaurant. <laughs> uh, I was there with friends and he was our waiter. <clears throat> Who chose this particular restaurant? I did. What, is that a crime? No, of course not. I'm just trying to get a detailed chronology. So, how did you get to know the deceased? He became interested in a friend of mine. And uh, he asked her out and they saw each other and they fell in love and he moved in with her and I met him through her. And this friend is? Uh, Glenda Harley. But he wasn't living with her when he died. He was living on his own in West Preston. Why was that? She found out he was having an affair and she threw him out. When did she do that? Uh, a couple of weeks ago. Hmm. What does Ms Harley do for a living? It's Dr Harley, actually. She's a, a psychotherapist to the rich and famous. Mrs Carson? Yes. Hello. I'm Glenda Harley. Hi. Come in. And this group of friends at the restaurant, were they also very successful people? Mm. Doctors, lawyers, captains of industry. How do you happen to know such successful people? I met them at university. We were all members of the film society and we stayed in touch. My goodness, you're impatient. Mm -hmm. I know. I'm looking at La Dolce Vita. I want La Dolce Vita tonight. OK. <clears throat> A bit of Anita Egbert. Okay, okay. Look at that's her. Right. She's yeah. great. Oh, gee, see, I'm oh, going to look beautiful. like her she's in my next life. <laughs> okay, here we go. And what do you do for a living, Miss Riley? I work for the government. I'm a policy officer. And how long have you been doing that? Since university. So you're happy in your work? I serve the community. <laughs> but serving the community doesn't pay a lot, does it? Actually, having such successful friends must remind you of that quite frequently. I think it's important to measure success in ways other than material possessions. Really? <laughs> really. Yet you drive very expensive cars, Miss Riley. Yeah. <laughs> That's my one, my one weakness. Mm. Hey. hey! What do you think? Nice ride. Got me on the car. Our boat. Yeah. And how do you afford them on your salary? I rent. I don't take expensive holidays. I don't have children. I don't have pets. I don't go to the opera. I don't own antique furniture or original artwork. Like your successful friends. Yeah, quite. Beautiful. Yeah. Wow. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it is. Is that open? Yeah. But the cars you drive are at the highish end of the market. Even a very frugal lifestyle would hardly allow you to afford them. Yeah, well, I've been lucky. I've had a few good wins. Good wins? Yeah, at the track, at the casino. I don't play very often, but I have been lucky. So would someone at the casino remember your good wins? I doubt it. Staff change all the time. They weren't exactly big wins, five or ten grand. That'd have been nothing to them. So no one at the casino would remember you at all? Well, they might remember seeing me around, but not the wins themselves. Do you often go to the casino? Uh, sometimes I go quite often, and then I don't go for ages. I'm an intermittent gambler. 
Now, getting back to the deceased, you said that he had an affair. Do you know who with? It was me, actually. But it wasn't really an affair. We just slept together a few times. I want to be two door and sporty. I love that hat. Oh, you are. Whoa, God. This is so good. I hope Glenda forgives me one day. <clears throat> she was my best friend. Did he have another job besides the restaurant? Uh, no, he was studying for a law degree. Oh, how was that going? He was in his second year. Apparently he'd had some drug and gambling problems in the past. And his father paid a hundred grand to clear his debts. But he had to finish his law degree or he'd be disinherited. Oh, so he intended to practice? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, apparently he really focused on his studies after he met Glenda. Hey, it's me. Um, yeah, I'm just working on the cardiac surgeon's wife and it's, it's harder than I thought. It's going to take longer. I, I don't know. Yeah, OK, fine. Look, um, I've got to get out of here anyway. She's coming home. Do you know if he was still gambling yeah, or right, using so. drugs? Mm, not while he was with Glenda. But, you know, after she threw him out, well, you know, well, who knows? He could have been into anything. I got my hands on some money. Some real money. I'd be out of here in a shop. And what would you do with some real money? I'd buy a yacht. Run away to some tropical island. <laughs> and run a bar on the beach. <laughs> well, I might just have a way of you making some of that real money. But it'd take a bit of time. You'd have to be in it for the long haul. If he gets me that yard, I'll do anything. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. How did Glinda find out about your liaison? Their mobiles got mixed up and uh, there were some calls on her bill that uh, she hadn't made and they were to me and uh, she ended up hiring a private detective. Boss, can I see you for a minute? Excuse me, Miss Riley. Interview suspended at 3.10 p.m. Well, we've had some luck. One of her former bosses was prepared to blab. Apparently, he did a little horizontal folk dancing with her at one of the office Christmas parties five years ago. She kept the condom and threatened to tell his wife, now ex-wife, if he didn't cough up in cash. Oh. And when pushed, a couple of others said they'd heard rumours about people being blackmailed for having affairs or problems with alcohol or drugs. Mm, well, who's the clever little minx then? Looks like she had quite a racket going, but I'm guessing she wants a lot more. She has got very expensive tastes. Mm. Well, forensics are searching her place now, and Tony's going through all the stuff at the deceased house, so something might turn up. Mm, thanks. Keep me posted. Sure, boss. Tom, that new aftershave. It's nice. I don't know, but I'm sure he'll be here soon. Interview recommenced at 3.15 p.m. Now, you stated that Dr... What was her name? Harley. Harley. Found out about your liaison and, what, severed contact with you and the deceased? <laughs> I didn't say that. Yeah, that's quite right. And did anyone else know? Yes, she told our friends, all of them. They blamed you? Yeah. Yeah, they wouldn't even listen to my side of the story. Barb, it's Susan. Can you give me a call when you get in? It's important. <laughs> Thanks. They closed ranks around Glenda.
Well, that must have been very hard, losing such long-standing friendships over what was, uh, well, really just an indiscretion. Yeah. Yes, it was. But everybody always liked Glenda more than me. Everybody loves Glenda. Did you keep in touch with Michael after Glenda threw him out? We talked on the phone. But I didn't see him till, till Saturday night. He called me and um, he sounded in a really bad way. So I, well, I was very concerned about him. I thought he might do something stupid. So I went over to see him. And how was he? He'd been drinking pretty heavily. That you're sorry, you apologize. And he was wallowing in self-pity. Can you hear me? Are you listening to me, Michael? Yeah, it's your fault! I know, that's what you have to say. That's fine. That's what you have to say. I was trying to tell him that Glenda would take him back if he'd just prove his devotion. But he just kept on mumbling about how he didn't deserve her and how she was his soulmate and how he'd lost her. And he just went on and on and on and on. He wouldn't listen to a word I said. I might as well not have been there, really. Why do we You're in it for the long haul. Will you stop this? It's easy for you. Yeah, it's easy for me. All right, it's easy for me. You're a fucking idiot. Anyway, I just had enough and left. Well, we can't find a witness who heard you leave. Well, that surprises me. The door nearly fell off its hinges. I slammed it so hard. Well, what time did you leave? Uh, I don't know. I was pretty angry when I left and I, I just drove around for a while. I got lost. When I got home, it would have been um, 11 o'clock. Mm, I'll see. So you don't have an alibi for any time on Saturday after the deceased rang you? No. No, I guess I don't. Mm. And why were you so sure that Dr. Harley would have taken him back? Because she loved him. And he looked after her and he was probably the first man to ever do that. It, but before you said that everybody loves her. Yes, but Glenda found it difficult for men, well, to get men to actually fall in love with her. She had a few issues about her body, about her weight. She hated it, couldn't change it. <laughs> Sure. Sure. Hey. Linda. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> she once told me that it was like having a working class tattoo right in the middle of her forehead. But Michael was different. Yeah. Yes, he was. I think she would have forgiven him. It was just a matter of time. Now, the deceased was stabbed with a kitchen knife by someone who is right-handed. Are you right-handed, Miss Riley? <clears throat> yeah. Yes, I am right-handed. As are you. But he was definitely alive when you left. Why would I want to kill him? So who do you think did it? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he was into drugs or gambling again and maybe, maybe he'd racked up some debts. I don't know, maybe. Maybe it was a robbery. I mean, he wasn't very careful. When I got there, 
He was showing some kids his expensive mobile and his iPod. Michael, how's it going? M maybe someone just wanted to, maybe someone just went in and wanted to see what else he had. I don't know. All I know is that I didn't kill him. Excuse me again, Ms. Riley. Interview suspended at 3.20 p.m. Can you tell me when I can get out of here? Tony's just pieced together some crumpled notes in the deceased waste paper basket. Now, apparently, he and Riley had this scam to blackmail Hartley's clients. Of course. Yes. They're wealthy and they would have a lot of secrets that they wouldn't want to see the light of day. Susan would know this and she's greedy enough to want to cash in on it. Oh, yes. Oh, but Harley would have a complex code to conceal the client's identity, so Riley would need somebody who could be close, somebody who could monitor the client, somebody who could spend time decoding the files. Which is where the disease comes in. You bet, yeah. And once she's got him, it's easy. She organises the dinner in the restaurant, he asks Harley out, Harley's so flattered she agrees, and before long she's asked him to move in. No one would even suspect Susan mm. of being involved. That's what we call a nice little owner. Yeah, you've got to admire her. She's an operator, all right. But the thing is, it looks like he decided to win Harley back by coming clean. See, the letter said he wanted to put all his cards on the table and make a fresh start because he really did love her. Mm. Well, we need to see if Harley got that letter. <sighs> if she found out, right, that he was going to rat on her, maybe she killed him to shut him up. But as she keeps saying, he wasn't very careful, right? Maybe... Mm. Maybe... Maybe you left something incriminating around. No, I don't think Susan no? killed him. Mm -mm. Why? Experience. You know, she is some piece of work, but she's no murderer. We're not the spur of the moment mm. kind. She's far too calculating for that. Well, what about Harley then? I mean, she would have been pretty angry to find out that the man of her dreams was, you know, screwing her friend, right? Well, the deceased phone records indicate that, yes, he did call her on a number of occasions, but the calls were quite short and she might not have even spoken to him. I mean, there were no emails from her on his laptop. She said that she didn't know where he lived. So, I mean, it is possible she had completely severed contact. Mm. Well, does she have an alibi? Well, she says she was home alone at the time of the murder. Um, nobody called. If she did go out, nobody saw her leave or return and nobody saw her car near the deceased place. Hmm. Well, we'll out then. I don't understand. I mean, someone's always there to see something, right? Mm, yeah. No one can be that lucky. Mm. No one could be that lucky. You anyway, know, women don't use knives. Well, maybe it's like she said, probably gone wrong. Maybe, maybe it was a hit. Drug or gambling related. Yeah, maybe. But look, our masters like cases to be closed and there's a lot of evidence against our little blackmailer. Mm. A conviction looks good on our stats. Murderers must be brought to justice. Politicians want that. The community wants that. No, I need to speak to Harley. Has she arrived yet? Yes, I've put her in interview six. Good, good. I'll go there now. Tom, you come with me. Paul, take Riley to the cells. Let her cool her heels until forensics arrive. Let's go. Good afternoon. I'm Detective Inspector Sturrock. Thank you for coming in, Dr Harley. We appreciate it. Well, of course, I'm prepared to help. But I have told your sergeant everything I know. Yes, but this is a murder investigation and we need to be very thorough. Now, we routinely videotape all our interviews. Can we begin? What would you like to know? The time is 3.30pm. Present in the room is Detective Inspector Sturrock and Detective Tom Barnes interviewing Dr Glenda Harley. Now, Dr Harley, I'd like to start at the very beginning. Where did you first meet the deceased? Uh, at a restaurant. He was a waiter. I went with a group of friends. We started talking and he asked me out. And you continued seeing each other? Yes. Then he moved in? Yes, that's correct. Hi. Gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, my God. 
But he moved out recently. That's one way of putting it. Well, how would you put it, Dr. Harley? <sighs> to be perfectly blunt, I found out he was having an affair, so I, I threw him out. We have found a number of drafts of a letter at the deceased's house that were addressed to you. Did the deceased send you a letter, Dr. Harley? He sent me lots of letters. Which one? Ice surgeon. Excuse me, Dr. Harley. Interview suspended at 3.35 p.m. I just got a call from forensics, right? And get this, they found a bloodstained knife in a plastic bag in Susan Riley's rubbish bin. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on a pretty lucky day. Normally the garbos would have been around by now, but apparently they had some trouble with the truck and they're running a bit behind. Then we can't be 100% soon until it gets back from the lab. But we're pretty bloody confident it's the murder weapon. Although, 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 one problem. There's no prints. Wow. Sometimes you get a break like this and it really seems like God's on yeah, your side. Yeah, yeah. Have her brought up. We'll question her again and maybe charge her. I'm already a step ahead, boss. She's on her way up now. Right, good work. <laughs> OK, well, I guess I better cut this one loose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah. Thank you, Dr Harley, but that will be all. You mean I can go? Yes. Some new evidence has come to light, which means we don't need to question you any further at this time. But if things change... Yes, I understand. I won't leave town. Little murder 